Welcome to Electronline. In the previous video, we realized that in order to find an equation that describes the probability of finding a particle at a particular location, we would have to normalize what we would call the probability density or the probability distribution. So we realized that we had an equation that we called P of x and t that could be called the probability distribution function or the probability density function. And here we drew it on the board. And we realized that if that function had a large amplitude, it meant that it was more likely to find the particle at that particular location in x. And if it had a small amplitude, it was less likely to find the particle. But it was a relative number. It wasn't an absolute number. You couldn't say that it was the exact probability. The reason for that is that the curve, the area need to curve, should always equal 1 if we have a probability function. Now let's assume that the particle can only exist between A and B. Obviously it's more likely to be found in the middle and less likely to be found close to A and B. This is just a hypothetical situation. We don't have the actual equation yet to describe that. That will come later. But in order to make that into a probability function, not a probability distribution or probability density function, we have to normalize this. We have to make sure that the area underneath this curve equals 1. That means then that there is a 100% probability of finding that particle between A and B if the area underneath the curve is exactly equal to 1, which of course is 100%. So the condition must be satisfied that if we integrate the product of the wave function and its complex conjugate, and we integrate it over all the places where it can be, in this particular example, it can only be between A and B, that integral should add up to 1. You'll see this expression of the equation a lot because they're just saying is just integrate over all x if it's one dimension or over all space if it's three dimensions. But we realize, of course, that typically the particle will be limited to a particular location and so it will be hemmed in by the upper and lower limit, typically smaller than negative and positive absolute uh, infinity, of course. So let's go back to the wave function that we had in the previous videos, which represented a single particle in one dimension that had no forces acting on it and the potential energy was constant. If we take that, this would be a good function to describe that, a good wave function, and this would be the complex conjugate. All with this, what changes sign of the imaginary number i. Now when we take the product of that, what do we get? So we have the wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate. That's going to be a times e to the i kx minus omega t multiplied times a e to the minus i times kx minus omega t. And so when we multiply this together, we have a times a, which gives us a squared. But now we have the exponential number i k x minus omega t and minus i k x minus omega t. And if we multiply this together, the bases are the same. We add the exponents. And when we add the exponents, we realize they cancel out. This is the positive. This is the negative. Add them together, you get 0. So this ends up being e to the 0, which of course is equal to 1, which means that the product of those two, the product of the wave function and its complex conjugate, is actually equal to a squared. Now we plug that into the condition that we must satisfy. We know that if we take that product, multiply times dx and integrate from a to b, where the particle can be, that should add up to 1. So let's go ahead and do that. So we say that the condition, from a, when we integrate from a to b, of the product, which we now know is a squared, times dx must equal 1. Of course, a squared is a constant. We could take that outside the integral sign. So we can say that a squared times the integral from a to b of dx must equal 1. And when we integrate that, that then becomes a squared times x evaluated from a to b must equal 1. Of course, then we plug in the upper and lower limit and we get, let's come over here, a squared times b minus a, plug in the upper limit, minus when you plug in the lower limit, equals 1 or a squared equals 1 over b minus a or a equals 1 over the square root 
of B minus A. Now you can see that when you try to normalize a wave function, what you're trying to do is find the proper value of the constant in front of the wave function, right here, the A, this constant. You'll see that a lot in a lot of wave functions. They'll all come with a constant. We have to find the correct value of that constant, in this case, 1 over the square root of B minus A, so that when we go ahead and find the probability density, the area in the curve will be equal to 1, and it actually will represent the real probability of finding a particle at a particular location. And we'll expand on that just a little bit more in a later video. What this now means is that the proper wave, wave function for this particular situation, a single particle with mass m uh, that has no forces acting on it and that has a constant potential energy, that wave function will now become 1 over the square root of b minus a times e to the minus, or in this case we had as a plus, e to the i times kx minus omega t. Now what we have is a normalized wave function. That's exactly what we mean by normalization. We've been able to take the constant of the wave function, find its proper value, so that when we draw the probability function, we know that the area in the curve will be exactly equal to 1. That means that any point along that line, along that function, represents the true probability of finding the, the, the particle at that location. So all we have to do is pick a value for x right here, and then we read off the probability of finding that particle at that particular location. And that's, again, what we mean by normalization.